so much to Charity Village for inviting us to be here today. Um, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are presenting this from the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. It's a traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous peoples, including numerous Western Canadian First Nations, as well as the Métis people, who have called this area home since time immemorial. Their relationships to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and our life as a community. We would also like to acknowledge that any discussion of intercultural competence would be incomplete without recognition of our own cultural context. My name is Dan Garcia, and I identify as Latin American, Canadian, male, heterosexual, millennial. My background is in association and project management. I also serve on the board of the Canadian Society of Association Executives. I became interested in intercultural competence work as a result of both my professional background and personal experiences. My family is originally from Central America. Growing up, I was regularly interacting with people from diverse backgrounds and circumstances. I felt like I had a good grasp on multiculturalism and its effects on me as a professional, my communities, and our society at large. After starting on my own intercultural development, I learned that being in a multicultural environment is not synonymous with being in an intercultural environment. This was a critical realization that has helped me in my own journey of intercultural development. And my name is Jennifer Flynn, and I identify as female, Canadian, heterosexual, white, and Gen X. Unlike Dan, I grew up in a relatively homogeneous environment. My background is predominantly in law and education. I have a business degree, majored in international business, a law degree, a graduate degree in communications and technology, and I'm a chartered professional in human resources. I won't say exactly when I started practicing law, but I will tell you that one of my first matters involved legal work in preparation for Y2K. I ended up moving out of private practice and into the field of legal education and assessment. And my own journey of intercultural development was really born out of my research into professional competencies and the realization that intercultural competence really is so critical. Wherever you are on your own intercultural journey and whatever brought you here today, welcome. We want to start today with a bit of a story. Once upon a time, there was an organization that we would call Zip Future. A brief disclaimer, this group and events are fictional. Any resemblance to actual groups or events or any organization you've worked in is purely coincidental. That said, this scenario is inspired by our collective 20 plus years in not-for-profit leadership, as well as years of experience in government, for-profit, and education sectors. So here's an organizational overview of the future. It has an important mission, but limited time and money. The people who work there are well-intentioned and hardworking. Most of the people aren't really against the idea of diversity. In fact, many claim to be colorblind and often emphasize that deep down, people are all the same. In conversations about culture, some team members champion the idea that it is the zip future culture that really matters. That said, the group has taken some steps to improve diversity, including putting a we value diversity statement on their job postings and a similar sign up in their lunchroom. Last month, they ran a one hour diversity training for all staff. The group even tried to hire a few more diverse people. And while a couple fit right in, many just didn't work out. Recently, the group has had some challenges, maybe Something in the wake of Me Too, maybe unresolved intergenerational conflict, 
Maybe someone in the organization calling out a lack of diversity. Maybe a funder wanting to see improved equity, diversity, or inclusion outcomes. Maybe something in the light of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Maybe just higher turnover or a general lack of productivity or engagement. Maybe a general desire to do more. The organization wants to address these challenges, but it isn't sure where to start. We suggest that one of the most meaningful ways to approach these challenges is to look at intercultural competence. Our goal in this session is to help you or your team or organization take a truly meaningful step towards addressing this complex topic. First, we'll start by defining some relevant terms, including what intercultural competence is. Then we'll help you understand why intercultural competence is so critical. And finally, we will consider how intercultural competence can be assessed in a meaningful and defensible way. To begin, we want to get on the same page with a few terms. If you engage in this work, you know that there are many specific terms that come to light. We recognize that different people may define some terms differently and that terminology in this area is evolving. So we want to share a few definitions we are using. So that way we're all on the same page. For our purposes today, we will look at four terms, culture, diversity, inclusion, and intercultural competence. Let's start with defining what we mean by culture. Understanding culture means understanding that what we learn and internalize from the groups to which we belong shapes the way we experience the world and conduct ourselves in it. These patterns of interpretation and behavior form our culture. In talking about culture, an iceberg is a common metaphor. It emphasizes that some parts are immediately visible, but there's a lot more beneath the surface. In defining culture, some people focus on elements of objective culture, such as art, architecture, celebrations, literature, and history. Others emphasize subjective culture. For our purposes, we are interested in the subjective elements of culture. In other words, we're not just talking about the tip of the iceberg, but those deeper levels. Now, while an iceberg can be a good metaphor in some ways, it falls short in others. For example, culture is not singular or static like a block of ice. Other metaphors for culture we often see include rivers, ponds, or a rainforest. This adds an appreciation for the complexity of what culture is, how it is intertwined with other facets of our ecosystem, and its evolving nature. Whichever metaphor resonates most for you, it's important to note that for our purposes, we define culture very broadly, taking into account many lines of difference. Specifically, we use culture to refer to the values, beliefs, perceptions, and behaviors learned from the groups to which we belong. And we recognize that we belong to many different groups that can shape our patterns of interpretation and how we act. These groups may be based on ethnicity or nationality, but may also be based on a range of other factors, including gender, age, religion, sexual orientation, family background, educational background, work experience, and many others. When we think about culture in the context, for example, of our teams or organizations, we may talk about diversity. We use the term diversity to refer to the presence of meaningful cultural differences, or in other words, differences that make a difference. In assessing our diversity, we might ask, how many people on our team or in our organization represent which lines of differences? Do we have a mix of perspectives represented? While diversity can be important, diversity isn't usually the end goal. 
usually what we're trying to achieve is inclusion. Inclusion refers to how we're leveraging the differences in a way that increases contributions and opportunities for all. We don't just want to mix. We want to mix that works effectively with everyone feeling valued, involved, and empowered. In assessing inclusion, we might ask, how are engagement levels or organizational climate? How much unproductive conflict do we have? How much turnover? Just because you have diversity doesn't mean you will have inclusion. The missing link is intercultural competence. Intercultural competence is the key to making the mix work. It can also influence the degree of diversity that is hired into and retained in an organization. So what is intercultural competence? Not surprisingly, there are many definitions out there. For example, Dr. Mitchell Hammer's definition is the capability to shift cultural perspective and appropriately adapt behavior to cultural differences and commonalities. Intercultural competence reflects our ability to gather, interpret, and act on different cues to work effectively across cultural settings or in multicultural situations. Intercultural competence is often thought to have three important aspects to it. One is cultural self-awareness. Another is an understanding of the experiences of people from different cultural groups. And the third is the ability to bridge across these differences. There are many reasons why intercultural competence may be important to an organization. One of the most critical is organizational performance. Higher levels of intercultural competence are associated with greater success in hiring diverse talent and with helping create an inclusive environment. Diversity and inclusion are, among other things, known drivers of employee engagement. Engagement is the key factor in the promotion of higher performance. Let's take a moment to come back to our story about Zip Future. If our fictional organization is like many other organizations, it may be lacking in certain types of cultural diversity. We would also assess this by looking at, for example, the mix of meaningful cultural differences in the organization. We would also consider how these might differ from one, say, department to another and at what levels of the organization, from entry level to senior leadership positions. We would also be interested in inclusion in the organization. So we might look at engagement scores, climate surveys, and other factors. If Zip Future isn't happy with their answers to both sets of questions, that suggests to us that the organization might benefit from developing its intercultural competence. But how do we assess this? And why is that important? Those are good questions, Dan. How do we assess intercultural competence and why should we? Well, I'll start by saying that I've been fortunate to have been involved as an educator in adult and professional education for almost 20 years now. And in my experience, one of the most critical components of learning and development is assessment. I believe this is true of many competencies, but of intercultural competence in particular. Now we use diagnostic tools for all kinds of things. We get blood tests to help us understand our health. We track our steps. We have multiple gauges on our motor vehicles. And yet, when it comes to critical areas of professional competence, we're still mostly winging it. We believe that using diagnostic tools or assessments for professional competence can be incredibly valuable. So consider this scenario. 
if someone wants to be a better runner, should you just give them a training plan that has them run 5K tomorrow? This intervention may be useful, but only if it's appropriate for the runner's current stage of development. Are they already a competitive athlete, or are they just starting out? Knowing matters. While one improvement plan may be helpful for some, for others, it can be useless, or even worse, harmful. So before investing our limited resources, our time, our energy, our money, it's worthwhile to start with an assessment. Assessments can help us in the early stages by defining a starting point or establishing a baseline. It can help with diagnosing development opportunities to help us choose optimal interventions. It can prime people for learning so they learn more effectively. Assessment can also help us develop competencies during the learning process by helping us distinguish the positive aspects of our thinking or behavior, things we might want to replicate, from negative ones, things we want to avoid. Assessment can also help us after a learning intervention by helping us measure progress towards a goal, so giving us data about whether our interventions are succeeding, and helping us identify new goals and future learning opportunities. In short, that which is measured improves. Now the challenge, especially with something like intercultural competence, is how to assess it accurately and feasibly. Let's consider some assessment options. There are three typical ways that people in an organization assess intercultural competence. The first, and by far the most common, is by self-assessing. In most organizations, I'd say this is the only form of assessment being used. The second is an assessment by, for example, a supervisor or a manager. And the third is by using some kind of assessment instrument or tool designed for this purpose. Let's consider some of the pros and cons of each. First, we have self-assessment. As I mentioned, self-assessment is the most common way we assess intercultural competence. It is the most common, in large part, because it's easy. But while it's easy, it is also notoriously ineffective. People are terrible at self-assessing, especially in this area. There is both general and specific research that confirms this. And yet, we self-assess when we decide what continuing professional development activities to engage, what to read, what to learn, what we tell people we're good at, what assignments we choose to take on, what we put down as skills on our resumes. Whether consciously or not, you probably self-assessed your intercultural competence when you decided to take part in this webinar. Other people in your organization may have heard about this webinar and self-assessing their intercultural competence decided they didn't need to take it. You, however, thought this might be worthwhile. I would predict that the people taking this webinar may not be the people in their organizations who need it most. But that's self-assessment for you. We don't know what we don't know, and that makes self-assessment, without more, a suboptimal assessment method. A second way that organizations assess intercultural competence is through, for example, a supervisor or a manager. This may be done formally or informally, 
for example, a manager may be making decisions about how to evaluate someone's performance or what professional development an individual or a group might benefit from. Now, this can be positive in that it telegraphs a certain importance about intercultural confidence, but there are, however, some challenges inherent in this process. For example, just because someone is in a managerial role does not mean that they are interculturally competent themselves. And even if they are, that doesn't mean they have the skills to assess it. Different managers may see things different ways. They may have unconscious biases that interfere with accurate assessment. They may conflate other characteristics such as likability with intercultural competence. And if they aren't assessing accurately, reliably, and fairly, they may be doing a genuine disservice to the organization and its employees. So while you may have a manager who knows what they're doing, knows what to look for, and assesses consistently, this is not common. A third option is to use a tool designed to assess intercultural competence. Such a tool can be used on its own or to help improve self-assessment or assessment by managers. The pros and cons of using a tool, such as a test or an inventory, really depend on the specific tool. So we will help you understand what you should be looking for. Before doing the consulting work that Dan and I are doing now, we both worked in the field of what's known as high stakes credentialing. In particular, I was responsible for overseeing the delivery of the bar admission program for lawyers in Alberta. And let me just say, when you are evaluating law school graduates as to whether they have the competencies necessary to practice law, you learn a lot about defensible assessment. If you are assessing competencies, and that includes intercultural competence, I can tell you you're striving for four things. Validity, reliability, fairness, and practicality. In a high stakes environment, like say bar admission, Factors like validity, reliability, and fairness are extremely important. In a lower stakes environment, like helping someone self-assess their professional development needs, these are still desirable, but we also need to be practical. Let's look at each of these. First, whatever tool or process you are using, should be valid. This means that it should measure what it's supposed to measure and not something else. For example, if a manager thinks, wow, that Bob is a nice guy and is nice to all kinds of people and conflates that with, well, Bob must be interculturally competent and must not need any professional development in that area that manager's assessment would lack validity. He's assessing something different than he thinks he is. The same thing can happen with a test or some other tool. For example, if you have a so-called intercultural competence test that really just focuses on someone's knowledge of, say, world geography, you would actually be measuring their knowledge of world geography and not intercultural competence. And you might be very surprised to discover that many assessments, both informal and formal, go wrong by measuring something other than what we think they are measuring. The best assessments actually go through a rigorous validation process that involves subject matter experts and statistics, 
to provide confidence that they measure what they intend. So if you're using, say, a third-party intercultural competence tool, you really want to look into whether and how that tool was validated and for what purpose. And the more you want to rely on this assessment, the more important validity evidence becomes. Second, an assessment should be reliable. This means that your assessment should measure consistently. For example, you may have managers in your organization who conduct employee evaluations. Let's say these managers are asked to assess employees in terms of their intercultural competence, perhaps to decide who might benefit from some additional training in this area. Leaving aside the whole issue of validity, so whether their assessment really captures intercultural competence and not something else, we need to ask ourselves, will this approach be consistent and reliable? If your managers have different training, different understanding of what intercultural competence is, if you have some who are so-called hard markers and others who are so-called soft markers, then this assessment approach would not be reliable. Similarly, if you're using a tool or inventory that doesn't measure consistently, giving, for example, different results on different days, that is problematic. Again, the more you want to rely on this assessment, the more important reliability is. In addition to being valid and reliable, an assessment should be fair. This means that an assessment should give all participants an equal chance to demonstrate their proficiency. Let's say that you have an assessment you are using to measure intercultural competence, but it uses examples that are more familiar to people of, say, one demographic group than another. That assessment might not be fair. And sometimes, you know, this happens really innocently. I, for example, 15 years ago when I was teaching law, gave a quiz using scenarios from the television show The Simpsons designed to make the quiz a little bit more fun. While you didn't need to know anything about The Simpsons to answer the questions, students who were familiar with the show and its characters, in other words, people of a certain demographic, actually found the questions easier. So that quiz lacked fairness. Ideally, if you are using an assessment for something like general intercultural competence rather than maybe knowledge of a specific culture, you'll want to ensure that it's been cross-culturally validated with people from a wide range of cultures. So valid, reliable, and fair are three of the things we always look for in evaluating an assessment instrument. If we had limitless resources, there are many steps that we could take to maximize validity, reliability, and fairness. But you know, in the ideal world, which I appreciate we don't live in, uh, experts suggest that we would use multiple methodologies to measure intercultural competence. For example, there's actually a great 2016 ETS report, we'll give the site at the end, called Assessing Intercultural Competence in Higher Education that proposes an innovative assessment model that would examine how we approach intercultural situations, how we analyze them, and how we act on them. And it proposes that we'd use a range of task types and response formats including, for example, um, intercultural scenario-based items, non-traditional behavioral skills tests, conditional reasoning, incident recollection, coaching tasks, and that is all great. Our challenge, however, is that we also need to be practical. While Dan and I are big into the academic research, we are pragmatists at heart. 
we have spent a lot of our careers in not-for-profit organizations. And while we care about defensibility, we also know that solutions need to be practical. So what kind of assessment is practical for you? Well, that depends on your context. But you'll want to think about things like how quick and easy is it to administer? How quick and easy is it for people to take? How long does it take to score and get results? How easy is it to interpret? And how much does it cost, both in terms of time and money? So knowing what we now know about assessments, let's come back to our company, Zip Future. Let's say that Zip Future wanted our advice on how to assess their group's intercultural competence. Well, to start, we would first look at their needs, goals, and readiness for change. For anyone looking to undertake a DNI initiative, we actually believe that understanding what a group is ready for or able to do can be as important as knowing what they hope to achieve. So we would be inclined to start with a bit of a context assessment for Zip Future. So let's say we did that and we learned the following. First, the company doesn't know whether or not their group is interculturally competent. And it would really like to know where the group is at in terms of its intercultural development. Let's say we also discovered that the company wants to engage in some training and other initiatives, but it really wants to target initiatives that would be most beneficial for its group, and it wants a way to be able to measure progress, to know whether the initiatives are working or not. The company also wants to be able to support individual team members in developing their individual intercultural competence. Ideally, it wants to provide staff with individualized development plans. We also discover in our context assessment that there is general buy-in from the group to do something but that they're sensitive to what the company is going to do, and we want it to be something defensible. And finally, like in many organizations, the company has resource constraints. At this point, they can only spare up to about one day of time and effort to make a meaningful difference, and they also have some money available, but really only a modest amount. Based on these findings, we would likely recommend an instrument like the Intercultural Development Inventory. The Intercultural Development Inventory, or IDI, is an instrument based on the Intercultural Development Continuum. It is grounded in research, adapted from Dr. Milton Bennett's developmental model of intercultural sensitivity, it recognizes that humans really progress through different stages on their intercultural journeys. We start by being in denial about cultural difference or missing difference altogether. As we start to notice cultural differences, we tend to view cultural difference from a more polarizing us versus them perspective or really judging difference. We may then move into a transitional mindset where we focus on commonality with the result that we may minimize or de-emphasize important difference. Ideally, some people may then move into a more intercultural mindset where they can more readily recognize and accept patterns of cultural difference, so more deeply comprehending difference. And then finally, some people may learn to shift cultural perspective and change behavior in authentic and culturally appropriate ways, thereby bridging across difference. We call this adaptation. 
The Intercultural Development Inventory is a short online instrument, only takes about 15 minutes, and it can quickly assess where an individual falls on this intercultural development continuum. We won't go into a lot of detail, but the report can tell you some interesting things, including what your perceived orientation is. So where you likely perceive yourself to be on this continuum, or where maybe you are aspirationally, as well as the primary lens through which you approach cultural difference or your developmental orientation. If you're using the IDI as an individual, you'll need to have your results delivered by a qualified administrator. And that includes a debrief that takes about 45 minutes. Most of our clients have actually found this part to be really valuable. And the IDI comes with individualized development plans that are customized based on where someone is on that intercultural development continuum. So this can really help individuals more effectively increase their intercultural competence. When administered to a group of people, the IDI can also report on that group's distribution across the orientations of the intercultural development continuum. This can help you better understand how consistent or maybe inconsistent your group's perspective may be when confronted with cultural differences and similarities. This can help a group or organization target optimal training and other initiatives. It can also be used for baseline assessment purposes, so to take a snapshot so the group can track its overall progress. One of the best things from our perspective is that this tool has been rigorously tested with evidence of validity and reliability across diverse cultural groups. It was cross-culturally validated with more than 10,000 individuals across a wide range of cultures, both domestic and international diversity, which from our perspective is so important for fairness. So coming back to Zip Future, the IDI is one instrument that we would likely recommend. This instrument suits its needs and goals that we identified through that context assessment. The company wanted to know where the group was at in terms of intercultural development, and this tool specifically assesses intercultural development. It wanted to engage in training and other initiatives that would be effective for the group. And so this can be used as a baseline assessment. So it can find out if putting a poster up in the lunchroom and a one hour training session is really making a difference for the organization. The company wants to help team members engage their own development plans. And so this is a good tool because it comes with those individual development plans. Also, we knew that the company had general buy-in and readiness for something, but cared that this was something defensible. And again, this particular instrument it has been psychometrically tested, so it's not a, not a Facebook quiz. And it has a recognition of the company's resource constraints. So it is relatively easy to complete and administer. So it's practical for their purposes. Now, the IDI has been used by a long list of corporations like General Electric, Microsoft, uh, Target, Disney, um, used in government, including by the Canadian federal government, Toronto Police, uh, US military, not-for-profit organizations, of course, including several churches, the YMCA, and many educational institutions, including uh, Queens, Cornell, just to name a few. But while the IDI is a widely used instrument, it is not the only instrument available. As always, you need to consider the specific purpose that for which you want to assess. So our Zip Future composite company reflects things we typically see 
in organizations, but we recognize your organization may have different needs, goals, and constraints. So one resource we will suggest to you is that independent ETS report I mentioned earlier, the citations on the slide, it includes a list of instruments, including the IDI, that purport to measure intercultural competence, and it includes some validity and reliability information for them as well. If you are looking for an instrument, but you don't have the time or staff to do all the research, it can be worthwhile to spend a few hundred dollars for an independent context assessment. And if you want more information about this, please feel free to contact us. So in summary, there are four main things that we hope you take away from this session. First, it is critical to remember that intercultural competence is really that link between diversity and inclusion. Without intercultural competence, your equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives may not meet their goals. Second, diversity and inclusion, and by extension, intercultural competence, are drivers of engagement and it's engagement that drives organizational performance. That alone really is reason to invest in this work. Third, to develop intercultural competence for an individual or group, we recommend that you assess it. This provides an effective starting point, supports the learning process, and helps you measure your progress. And fourth, when conducting an assessment process or selecting an instrument, you'll want to think about its defensibility. Is this assessment valid, reliable, and fair? And at the same time, you need to balance this with being practical. In addition, we've given you some information about one of the most widely used intercultural assessment tools, the Intercultural Development Inventory, or IDI, and tried to give a sense as to how it might be used in an organization. To wrap up, we know that many organizations have great intentions when it comes to equity, diversity, and inclusion, but many are paralyzed because they do not know where to begin. Other organizations, also with great intentions, think they know what needs to be done, and they march ahead with initiatives that end up being unhelpful, or worse, even harmful. And this is especially heartbreaking when we're talking about organizations that have important missions and limited resources. We know it's not enough to have good intentions. You need to know where to start. Thinking about what you learned today, we want to leave you with four self-reflection questions to help you take a meaningful step forward. First, are there ways in which you, your group, or your organization could benefit from improved intercultural competence? If so, do you know what initiatives would be most beneficial to your organization? In other words, do you know where you're starting from? Do you know where to target? Do you have a way to measure progress? If you know, how do you know? Are you using a valid, reliable, and fair instrument to give you confidence? Assessment can be really valuable, but assessment tools are not all created equal. It is crucial to find an instrument that works for your context that follows defensible standards before you invest in it. With that, we want to thank all of you for joining us today and to Charity Village for having us. We know this is a lot of content covering many different areas, so we've left time for questions so we can address what matters most to you. But please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions that aren't answered in the next few minutes. This is an incredibly important topic that we are passionate about, and we look forward to helping you on your journey of intercultural competence. 
Wonderful. I'd like to thank you both for an amazing presentation. You've given us lots to think about today, and we do have quite a few questions, so I want to dive straight in. And first, I'd like to kind of pitch a more personal question at the two of you, just wondering about your own personal experience with uh, these assessments. Have you taken them before? And, you know, what was what was your experience out of that? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, both Dan and I, of course, have taken um, lots of assessments, including the, the IDI. Um, I, for one, love assessments. That's probably not a, a common answer you hear from people. But uh, during my sabbatical a couple of years ago, I, I actually completed about 100 different assessments in different areas not just intercultural competence, over about a, a two-month period. And in terms of the assessments that I've done, um, including the ones we've talked about, the, the IDI for me was particularly meaningful. It is, you know, you think you, think you know. You think you know uh, how you are in terms of intercultural competence and where you fall on that spectrum. And it is really interesting to get some objective data that can pinpoint not only where you are, but can give you that sense as to what you should be focusing on in order to improve. Otherwise, sometimes we just keep focusing on the same things without actually making any progress and not realizing that we're not progressing. So um, I'm a personal fan. And just to add that, um, I have time and time again found the process of going through an assessment to just be incredibly insightful and sometimes unnerving and how much information can be pulled from simple questions. I remember early in my management experience, I took a leadership uh, assessment and it is 260 questions and in less than 12 minutes, it knew all my dirty little secrets about what I was good at and what I was bad at. But what was most powerful about that was it gave me a way to move forward and to recognize those blind spots. It's really a gift of self-awareness that it allows to a lot of people. That's a wonderful perspective. I, I love that. Um, now, we've had some questions about terminology come up, so I think this would be good to address. Um, first of all, uh, we're talking intercultural competency today. Is that more or less what we used to call cultural competency or cross-cultural competency? I think that's a really insightful question, and it's uh, this is such a dynamic space that we're in, and that's why we wanted to start with some definitions at the very beginning. Uh, yes, there are different uh, definitions that people use for all of those terms, but generally what we used to refer to as, as cultural competence, we are more properly referring to today as intercultural competence, but those, those terms come up. So, for example, in the, the legal field that I have um, most of my familiarity with, we're working on truth and reconciliation calls to action that talks about increased cultural competence. When we're talking about intercultural competence today, we're talking about the same thing there. That's a great clarification. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, uh, like what we what we've discussed today is very much sort of about the individual and the interpersonal and we've had some folks uh, wonder if there are similar types of assessments that are are useful for evaluating more systems or institutionalized practices. That's a great question. So uh, we usually look at assessments in this area in three different categories. And so uh, what we look at is, first of all, the often we're looking at diversity. And so when we're looking at diversity in an organization, we've got specific assessments that we look for around that. So those are, are usually numbers-based representation at different levels. We also have, of course, the intercultural competence assessment. And again, that's individuals, but also for a group or an organization. So we'll look at that for a whole you know, board, for example, or a staff department or an entire organization. 
We've got the inclusion assessment that, again, is looking at things from that bigger group perspective as well, and that gets into the um, engagement scores and climate surveys and turnover numbers and things like that. And so we have those different kinds of lenses that we use. There are also some things you can do if you're assessing sort of the, the equity principles at play in your organization. Our approach generally, though, is we start with that context assessment to see what an organization is really trying to get at. But in our experience, it usually all comes back to that intercultural competence, that uh, no matter which of these other areas you're looking at, if you're looking you know, smaller or bigger in terms of the organization, it usually starts with people having that baseline of intercultural competence and having people on those teams. Otherwise, we tend to see in organizations uh, these sort of systems changes that people will put into place, you know, policies and things of that nature, and they can't understand why those initiatives aren't resulting in the positive effects that they thought that they would. And usually the reason for that is that the people in their organization just haven't moved far enough along that intercultural continuum to really be supporting them. And so that's, that's why our focus tends often to come back to the intercultural competence piece. Great. And in terms of uh, making this an ongoing process, uh, can you tell us your, your thoughts on that in terms of timing? And is it a one-time uh, process? I, I assume it's not. I assume this would be an on ongoing thing that, that would want to be implemented. Well, you certainly can get some valuable information by taking an inventory or something like the IDI just once. Uh, you know, sometimes that can be really effective in jump-starting, for example, individual development or a discussion in an organization. Uh, but really, ideally, in this work, you're looking at something that's ongoing. And so that's one of the things that can be helpful with a developmental inventory. Like the IDI is you can take it, and then a year later, you can have people take it again. And so you can have an individual who will have a sense as to whether or not the things that they're doing are helping them to shift intercultural perspective or whether they're not. And I think, you know, from an organizational perspective, sometimes more importantly, you can get a sense as to whether the things you're doing in your organization really are having a meaningful impact. I I was was talking to to someone the other day who was saying, you know, we really care about this and we've put a poster up in our lunchroom, Jen, and we ran a one-hour diversity training, and we've, you know, we put this statement on things, and we're not seeing, people are still saying that we haven't achieved what we thought we should achieve, right? And so I think it's really eye-opening. Those were real examples that we used in our composite scenario. Um, that, you know, to have that data to show that you are, in fact, progressing, that your group is moving on this this continuum, I think, you know, just can be so helpful. Otherwise, you're really flying blind. And just to add to that, really, once you start looking into this and you do go through an assessment or start doing some self-reflection, you see intercultural competence at play everywhere you go, whether it's when you're picking a show on Netflix, whether you're standing in line at Tim Hortons and you see proxemics at work, when you see some ads that fall short on their intercultural competence and what they're actually supporting or promoting, it, it really is an area that once you shine a light on that, you can't then see it. Yes, I can imagine that. That is the case, Dan. Um, how, as we're talking about the assessments, how important is it to have a face-to-face -face setting, uh, or can these be done virtually? In terms of the IDI, if we're talking about something like the debrief, those can absolutely be done over the phone or through you know, some sort of video conference technology. That, that works just fine. Uh, sometimes people have a preference for doing things in person, but, uh, but that's, not, that's not necessary. 
The same thing is true if you're doing a, um, a context assessment. You know, sometimes we like to meet with people face to face, but it, we can also do things over the phone. Uh, group debriefs generally, there is some real value in pulling people together physically into a room together. And it also gives the opportunity to use some other types of, of assessments. Um, for example, there's another one that we periodically use called the intercultural conflict style inventory. It is uh, not specifically for intercultural competence, but it is, again, a short online instrument that helps people understand their approach for, say, communicating information and resolving conflict. That can be kind of fun as, as an exercise to do in a group, especially to get people you know, wrapping their heads around that idea of subjective culture. And so some of those types of things can be really powerful when you're doing them in that, you know, interpersonal face-to-face -face group setting. Now, Jennifer, you mentioned the debrief, and uh, we've had some questions come in uh, about what that looks like, and specifically, how do you ensure safety uh, for the person uh, in that in that setting. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what that debrief might look like? Sure, that's huge. I'm really glad that people were thinking about that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why with the IDI in particular, not every instrument, by the way, has a debrief associated to it, but the IDI does. The, the IDI, as you can imagine, that can be pretty powerful in terms of the kinds of dissonance a person might feel where they have what we call an orientation gap in particular. You think you're at acceptance, you think you're at adaptation, and it turns out you're in minimization or polarization or denial. And that is something that um, you know, we, we are really mindful of. So the debrief uh, requires a qualified administrator to go through it. Uh, both Dan and I have been through this training. It is really intensive training. You know, so you go away and you spend you know, several days going through and learning how to deliver these results in a way that does preserve that psychological safety for people. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why some organizations choose to use an independent evaluator because you can have someone internally who is a qualified administrator, but sometimes with that, that can be more challenging. Some people don't want their HR manager to know where they are at. And so have, preserving that confidentiality by having the one-on-ones done with someone who you don't go to work with every day can be really helpful. And so that is really a big focus for us in delivering those results. And again, it's why we don't just hand you a report. We sit down with people in person or over video or on the phone to really go through those results and make people feel comfortable about where they're at um, and to deliver that in a, in a respectful way. And I think something important to think about is that these results, it's not about being good or bad or this is where you should be or that you have to be developing to this goal. It's starting off just this is a summary of your experiences and your exposure to cultural differences. Um, something that's for us, we're still on our journeys of intercultural development and that may never end. It's something that is not a necessarily a one and done thing like many other things like i have two young kids i'm thinking about parenting it's not something i can just say something to my kids two or three times and expect that it's done it's a continuous investment and it's a different level of investment for each person and that goes to a context assessment for a group or to an individual it's really dependent on how much it means to you and how much it means to your organization Great. And for those of you that need to jump off the call, I know we're running on time here. Just remember, we are recording and uh, we do record the Q&A. So if you need to go, uh, you can access that later today and uh, catch up on what you missed. I have two more questions that I'd really like to cover before we sign off today. Um, so first of all, one that's come up several times, and I really hate to frame it this way, because uh, obviously there's a moral and ethical um, <laughs> approach to doing this. 
But, you know, at organizations, sometimes we have to get buy-in. So what would you uh, suggest are some of the business case arguments uh, for doing this? I know we talked a little bit about employee engagement. Are there some other ways that people might be able to um, advocate for this uh, with their leadership? Absolutely. There's a whole financial aspect that there's a lot of research available publicly that um, supports the investment in diversity and inclusion initiatives. One of the things that the reports and research really miss out on is that missing link of intercultural competence. But I'm thinking of one off the top of my head of um, Deloitte's, uh, I believe it's in a presentation, that waiter, is, there, is that inclusion in my soup? That goes through the financial benefits for an organization of supporting a diversity and inclusion initiative. Um, like I said, I could list dozens, but really you just it's as simple as a Google search. You can find a lot of financial benefits and across different fields from law to education to corporate, not-for-profit. Um, if you're looking for something to develop a buy-in strategy to sell it to a manager and get something started, you can find something specific to your sector and it's publicly available. But from the research we've conducted, there are a number of financial um, incentives to invest in this. Great, and so let's wrap up today with just talking a little bit more about how to access the IDI. So if folks want to get more information or they want to get started, can we talk a little bit about what that process looks like and where they should go uh, to access that? Sure, so there's a couple of different options around that. Uh, people are welcome to check out the, the IDI website. So it's a, a quick Google search. You're looking for the intercultural development inventory. And, the, and they have a website that has all of the validation research and information about it. And so if you're thinking about it, you're welcome to check that out. You will need to find someone who is a qualified administrator for this particular tool because you do need that debrief because of just the psychological safety element and having someone who's trained in delivering results. And so uh, you can look for qualified administrators in your area. Um, again, this is something that, that Dan and I do, so you're always welcome to, to send us an email and, and we can talk about uh, you know, different options through us if we can be of help. We, we love Love doing this work this is something we care a lot about so uh, don't hesitate to send us an email but that's what you're looking for is someone who is a qualified administrator of this inventory uh, you also have the option if you have a larger organization and this is something you want to do over and over then you can send uh, someone for the qualified administrator training there is a, you know, a certain cost associated with that and some time out of the office and you have to balance off the independent evaluator versus in-house questions. But for some organizations that makes sense to do. And information about being trained on administering this tool is also available on that website. And if anyone can't find anything, please, I hope that they'll send us an email. We, um, we love this work. This is some of the, the work that I think that we find most engaging and fun and uh, something we're really passionate about. So if there's anything we can do to help, really, please don't hesitate to, to send us an email. Well, thank you again, Daniel and Jennifer. I, I think it's clear that you both are passionate about this issue and, and we're so glad that we were able to have you here with us presenting today. Um, I do want to just remind everyone before we wrap up that we are going to follow up with you by email this afternoon or tomorrow morning with the webinar recording and the slide deck. So um, all the information that Dan and Jennifer presented today will be easily accessible for you. There will also be a short survey there. It takes uh, less than five minutes to fill out uh, about today's session. So we hope you'll complete that for us if you can. There is an opportunity there also to let us know if there's other topics you'd like to see covered in a future session. Uh, we are continuing this month's leadership series with a free webinar next week on May 16th uh, about uh, what a performance management process without ratings looks like in practice. Uh, there will be a link to register in the email that you receive later today or tomorrow. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, I hope to see you all again next week and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.